Yeah, so I thank you, uh, Recognizer, to provide me a chance to uh, discuss our recent project. So it's about IgG, and we're found, unlike the others, we'll try to focus on the IgG. It might also work as a marker and also might have a pathological role inside the uh, long COVID system. So yeah, I have no conflict of interest. So there are so far is a lot of uh, proposed pathophysiology for long COVID. For example, we have discussed quite some about latent viral infection that the virus just hide inside our cells and which cannot be targeted and cause the symptoms. And also microbiome might have dysbiosis that cause these functions. And also calculation problems, coagulopathy has been proposed, so microclot and also platelet activation in cells and also metabolism. I think a recent series paper talked about serotonin as actually caused by um, previous high type 1 interferon and therefore causes this disease. But today I'm going to focusing on, is it working? Yeah, so today I'm going to talking about uh, autoimmunity and particularly I'm really interested in the autoantibody that might cause this effect um, in uh, long COVID. Yeah, so first of all, we try to uh, distinguish between uh, whether there's a biomarker can indicate that autoimmunity play a role uh, between long COVID and healthy uh, donors. So the first thing to do is we compare the uh, patient have infected COVID but doesn't have co uh, long COVID. So after six months to a year, as well as the, our long COVID patient, which says, has developed a long COVID symptom after infection, and they are, of course, uh, past COVID infection, six months to a year. And then we did a serum protein. I mean, to make it clear to see, so actually separate protein from the immune system pro related protein and the neural system. And you can appreciate that from the neural system, you can see most of the markers are actually down regulated instead of um, up regulated in the. Uh, COVID, long COVID patient. This suggests that actually there are some protein, uh, neurological system disruption and mainly is a suppression in the long COVID. And interestingly is the immune system. So this uh, L, uh, LTA4H, which is a leukotriene uh, A4 um, uh, dehydro uh, hydrogenase, is actually one of the marker people also publish. So we also see that strongly induced in the long COVID it can serve as a marker. But what interests us is more is like a MAPS and the TREP2, which are actually viral sensing proteins. So we do see these proteins down regulating the patient. So it's actually kind of, from, okay, maybe there's some immune response and disruption as well as neurological effect in this patient. So what we did next is instead of this um, like high profiling of proteomic, we simply focus on a select of a in from cytokines, neural uh, degenerative markers, and particular interferons inside, so though both um, type 1 and type 2 interferons. And we did uh, unsupervised clustering to try to separate between um, um, patients, so then the machine algorithm didn't know that which one is a healthy, which one is a long COVID patient. And I think we can see that, so the blue one are the people without COVID, uh, long COVID and the orange one uh, are the dots are the, the patient with COVID. And you can clearly see a separated from the PC2. So the upper one, that's actually uh, the healthy and the lower one, lower part is actually contribute to the long COVID. And interestingly, you can see that the PC2R consists of all um, these interferons. And interestingly, it's the type, um, type 2 interferon, which is interferon gamma, is lower in general. So if the contribution is higher, that means it go to the top. So you can see that type, one, type 2 interferon, so interferon gamma, is actually higher in the healthy. That means they're lower in long copy. While the type 1 interferons, interferon beta and interferon alpha, is actually higher in the long COVID. So when we usually discuss about the immune interferons, we dump all interferons together, type 1, type 2, type 3. But actually, we see a separation between type 1 and type 2 interferons. And actually, this has been um, uh, figured out by other publications, and particularly the lower one, they, the, this paper, they actually found actually type 1 interferon actually trigger off this lower serotonin and therefore lead to long COVID symptoms. So we think it's really, really interesting. And, but this is just a serum marker, and we are very curious whether this serum markers actually contribute. Um, it's, just, it's a marker where it's actually a consequence instead of the, the, re uh, the reason why this patient developed long COVID. So we now try to focus on the, uh, on the uh, immunoglobin, which we think might be the causal factor. What we did first, we tried to separate the patient into three groups, and by using both the symptoms and their serum markers. So based on symptoms, we can categorize our patient population into three groups. One is with uh, post exertional malaise as the main symptoms, and the pain, and the tachycardia. And based on this, we also separate by their serum marker. We can clearly see that a red group has high uh, neurodamage markers. 
And compare with uh, the, uh, so if you separate the uh, neural damage marker groups uh, away, you can see that there are one group have high type 1 interferon, so it's a great group, and the one is with lower type 1 interferons. So we now we separate our patient into three groups based on the symptom and their serum profile, particularly focusing on the um, neural damage marker and type 1 interferon, we separate them into three groups. What we now do is we do an experiment. We first, of course, base separate the non pask and non long COVID or COVID patients. And then based on their clinical profile as well as the serum profile, we separate into three groups. And then we take their serum, we, um, and uh, of course, we took along the healthy control donors, and we isolate their immunoglobin G, so IgG instead of not, um, so just interferon G, not other interfer um, immunoglobins. We do peritoneal injection into the mice. And then now we have four groups of mice, and then we put them on the behavioral test to see how the mouse react to it. And after two weeks, we sacrifice the mouse, and then we uh, assess the data. And one of the most interesting features we found is that uh, we do a test to test how sensitive this mouse in the pan. And how we do that is we do a foam fair filament. And what we do is just uh, sound out tickly on the mouse. And then if the, so it, they measure the pressure when the mouse sends the pain or sends the touch. So by doing so, we can define how sensitive this mouse to kind of pain behavior. And interesting, or clearly we see that all three groups, so this is a pool of three groups, um, so you can really see that once the mouse receives a long COVID patient isolate IgG, so there's no other protein, just IgG into this mice, so this mouse developed a more higher sensitivity to pain or touch. And it's really striking because we really see a difference and we didn't see a recovery. But if we divide into the three groups as we separate it, we also see a slightly some difference. So some patient groups, as I mentioned before, they are like a yellow group with high sens higher sensitivity in the pain or they have more complaint about pain. They also have a more prolonged high sensitivity to pain as well as the red group. And more interestingly, if you take a look at different between, um, because we injected the uh, IgG2 for, my, uh, for female mice and for uh, male mice, and we also see a difference between male mice and female mice. So apparently there's also um, gender or sex differences, and so we also observe, and also the previous talk about that usually female more tend to develop uh, severe long COVID symptoms. So this is also something very uh, interesting to consider consideration. And then we try to know whether this effect can be, um, so this observed feature can be reproduced in an in vitro setting. So uh, together with the uh, sticking long COVID, the long COVID uh, patient association in the Netherlands, we did a um, education program at Utah University. So what we did is we create a cardiomyocyte spheroid, which is a kind of in vitro model of beating heart. So this is for actually little be uh, literally beating outside, the heart, um, outside our body. And then uh, we measure the beating pattern. So what we did is we purified IgG from the uh, patient or from the healthy donors and put them this IgG to the uh, cardiomyocyte spheroids. And we see actually the contractivity is reduced by the long COVID patient, but not by our healthy control. So it's actually suggesting that some of the uh, immunoglobins in the patient really affect the heart function, at least in, in these in vitro settings. And furthermore, so what we now want to do is whether there are also other effects on, as I mentioned, that this patient have like long, in, uh, less endurance and reduced muscle. So we want to see whether there's an effect, but we want to make it more targeting. So what we did is we actually do an auto end up the profiling. So we all profile 21,000 protein, human proteins. And it's most important is we think not only the membrane or secretory protein are, uh, have a, can be a target for this autoantibody, so it's also intracellular proteins. And we select the proteins that pop up from the patient as well as express in the muscle cells, and we buy them commercially available autoantibodies, and we put these selected autoantibodies to the muscle cells in, in, uh, in vitro. And very interesting, what we found is the membrane potential of the mitochondria, so their energy processing is disrupted in these muscle cells. They have a hyper um, a membrane potential. It could because of disruption of their energy process. 
So the take home message is now that we found that auto LDA antibody transfer can actually can induce long COVID like symptoms in mouse. And this is very important. First of all, it could use as a diagnostic marker. And second, it could also as a potential to lead to or the again, so what are the possible treatment that we can use? And this model can also use it in the future that can use to develop treatment or test treatment. Yeah, so with this, I would like to thank all the, peop all the people involved in the project, particularly all the patients that are very important, and also our uh, pa patient associates supporting us, and also the education program. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions.